healthy. It's up to you. Thank you very much, uh, Gordon, and it's really wonderful to see you here again and to be sharing the stage with you and my good friend, Bob. And as you know, Bob and I are members of the uh, Africa uh, a panel that came out of the Blair Commission on Africa. We call ourselves the Africa Progress Panel. And our responsibility is to monitor uh, the implementation of the promises made by the G8 and by the African government, G8 in terms of resources, and the African government to improve governance and to fight uh, corruption. Uh, it is a tough assignment, but we've taken it uh, very seriously. And I think uh, Bob and I complement each other very well when we go into these meetings and sit with those heads of states. And he looks them straight in the eye and, and call it like it is. <laughs> You know, I, I may come in, I may go first, very diplomatically, but just in case they did not understand. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, make sure they do. And so we've been having lots of fun together. I mean, as most of you know, I was born in Ghana and I went through, I lived through our independence, years of independence. I was uh, in my teens and when Ghana got its independence 50 years ago, and it was an exciting and exhilarating moment for a young person growing up in Ghana to see that from one moment to the next, all is changing in front of your eyes. That the governor was going to leave, the police commissioner was not going to continue to be British but a Ghanaian, the head of the army was going to be Ghanaian, and really lots of change. And suddenly you have an African prime minister when you've grown up through your teens, seeing a different, living a different reality. And it also gives you a sense that change is possible, even dramatic change is possible. So you go through life in a way not afraid to challenge or to seek change. Uh, and of course, 50 years on, where is Africa and what has it achieved? I was fortunate that this year, the independence, the golden jubilee of Ghana's independence, the government invited me to come and speak. They started a, a lecture series. I did that in, in March of this year. Then the president, the government of Malaysia, the prime minister of Malaysia, invited me to go and speak in Malaysia. They got their independence in August the same year, also celebrating their 50th anniversary. And I couldn't help comparing the situation of the two countries. Independence was obtained the same year. Economically, they were almost at par. The same amount of reserves in the banks, uh, the same level of uh, educational system. And we both look forward to the future with excitement and expectation that we are going to be prosperous, we are going to transform our societies. And when you look at the facts, Malaysia has achieved a lot. Economically, it's almost a, it's a, a, a approaching first state, um, uh, well, I don't know how to put it. I think it's, it's really when you look at the GDP, for example, its GDP is about 13 times that of Ghana. They have very effective and very good infrastructure. Uh, it's also multi-ethnic, multicultural society which has managed to stay together and, and prosper. And then you ask, ask yourself, what was the difference? What happened in Malaysia? Why was Ghana left behind? And you go back to the issue of governance, the, the point that Bob and I and my, our fellows of APP are focused on. We went through a series of coup d'etats which Malaysia avoided. We had one military regime after the other and that was a really a, a serious setback. So today when we talk of good governance in Africa, it's, it's a real, real, uh, there's a real need for that. I would like to look at the progress of Africa in three areas that no society can develop without focusing on three pillars, S security and safety for the population, economic and social development, and respect for rule of law and human rights. 
when we look at the three areas, Africa has achieved something in the peace and security area. When I took office in 1997, there were 41 civil wars and wars in the world. Today, there are 31. And quite a lot of the wars that have ended have been in Africa, from Angola to Burundi to even Rwanda that went through this terrible, horrible tragedy of genocide. It's on its way up and is stabilizing. Sierra Leone has been uh, stabilized, Liberia, and many other conflicts. But of course, we still have Darfur. We still have a problem in southern Sudan and northern Uganda uh, that we need to deal with. We have fragile states of Chad and Central African Republic. But a lot has been achieved, and the governments and the people are beginning to realize that until you can resolve these conflicts, you cannot focus on the essential issue of economic and social development. And uh, the governments are coming together in the regions to work on these conflicts. Take the West African uh, 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 organization, ECOWAS. ECOWAS has not hesitated to interfere in conflicts, whether in Ivory Coast, Liberia, or Sierra Leone. In the past, they would have said, we don't interfere in internal affairs. And I kept reminding them, these conflicts do not remain internal for long. They throw up refugees, they destabilize a the region, they give it a bad name, and nobody invests in a bad neighborhood. It scares away investors. And so it is your business. Don't let any government tell you it's not your concern because it's within my borders. And, it, uh, and of course, the member states themselves reaffirm this concept by approving the responsibility to protect at the 2005 summit in New York. And by that responsibility to protect, they argued that it is the responsibility of each government to protect its people from genocide, ethnic cleansing, and gross and systematic abuse of human rights. And that where that government failed, it is the responsibility of the global community acting through the Security Council to take action, including force as a last resort. In other words, we are telling the governments that you can no longer use sovereignty as a shield behind which you can hide and brutalize your own people. But it is also saying to us, the others who are outside that country, you have no excuse. You have to act. You cannot just leave it to the government because it's an internal affair. And that some crimes are so shameful and shame us all that we cannot attribute it and leave it to others to respond and that we all have to uh, act. So that we have seen uh, progress in Africa on some of these uh, fronts. On the economic and social areas, we suddenly seen a, a large number of African countries growing at the rate of about 5% a year for several years. This hasn't happened in a long time. Of course, quite a lot of it is due to uh, the high commodity prices, but uh, quite a lot of them are moving forward and they are determined to improve their economic uh, situation. Civil society is becoming very active and pressing governments to fight corruption and respect the uh, human rights and the rule of law. They are not as strong as I would like to see them, but they are uh, moving uh, forward. We have also uh, seen a situation where new investors are coming to the continent, joining the traditional donors and investors. The Chinese and the Indians are very active, so are the Brazilians. But we need to find a way of getting the old and the new donors and the players to work together for the benefit of Africa and for our mutual uh, benefit. But I think if I look at the... Um, the, the role of the outside world, I have to say that the responsibility, the basic responsibility for developing the country, the basic responsibility for assuring governance lies with the African leaders themselves and the African people. But the international community has a role to play in supporting these uh, efforts. And I 
can say from my own observation, international solidarity is not only possible, it is necessary. It was barely two weeks ago on the 26th of um, September, we held the second replenishment conference to raise money for the Global Fund for AIDS, Malaria and Tuberculosis and we were, and, and TB, sorry. We were able to get $10 billion and that is certain. It sounds like a big amount, but when you look at the nature of the problem, it's still not enough. But we did get it. Governments and, uh, around the world provided the money to help those uh, in need. And obviously, they would want to make sure that the money is spent properly. It goes to those who, are, uh, who need it most and that it is used effectively. And this is the challenge for UNAIDS, World Health Organization, and the Global Fund. And from my discussions with them and with the governments at the receiving end, they are determined to do that. Despite these positive developments, there are many challenges uh, in Africa. We are talking of economic development, we are talking of development assistance, but at the same time, some of the gains are being eroded by the impact of global warming. When we talk of global warming and climate change, most of us t tend, to t tend to think it's something down the line, but it is actual. It has happened, it is happening, and it's having a real impact on communities and individuals, either by sustained drought, water stress in their countries, leading to water stress, floods, changing weather patterns that destroy the agricultural production. Those on small island states are afraid that their whole communities will be washed away. And the areas where most majority of pop world's population live is also going to be affected, the coastal cities, which uh, is uh, really at great risk. But it's not just coastal cities. I was in New York last week, and I talked to your successor, the president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Most of you will know that uh, Gordon used to do that. We had an interesting discussion, and they've also taken adaptation very seriously and said we are doing a project with the mayor of New York looking at four cities, including New York, to see what would happen if, God forbid, there were to be a Category 4 hurricane hitting New York, as it did in uh, uh, Louisiana. You can't move the people out. They can't get out anyway through all these tunnels. So you have to have a strategy of protecting them to the extent possible within the city. And if you are not prepared, how do you cope? And so the impact is not just for, uh, it's, it's not an issue for poorer countries or distant countries or regions. It affects rich and poor. And we need to really uh, focus on that. And I, if we are going to do something about adaptation, take preventive measures, reduce risks, we have to start today. And it is going to cost money. And the money cannot come from these poor countries. I know it sounds as if a hand is always out asking the rich countries to pay more. But in this particular situation, we are in the same boat. No one can be secure at the expense of the other. So we have to come up with the resources. Not only we have to tackle climate change in, on two fronts, mitigation, that is to curb the emissions, and adaptation to take preventive measures and take uh, uh, risk re reduction measures and increase the resilience and reduce the vulnerability of the, country, of the countries uh, at risk or communities at risk. And I hope it will come, but we will not be robbing Peter to pay Paul take development money to fight the impact of global uh, change, climate change. Both are necessary and is going to require additional resources. On the issue of human rights and the rule of law, I think I have two minutes. On the issue of, <laughs> on the issue of human rights and the rule of law, uh, let me say that um, uh, there has been progress in Africa. Today you have no military ruler in Africa. It was about 15 years ago when 
We had so many of them. I recall my first African Union meeting in, uh, it was interesting enough, in Harare, where I challenged the African leaders not to accept any leader who comes to power through the barrel of the gun, and that we should tell them they cannot sit with other elected leaders. I recall Salim Salim is here, I mean, he's in London. He was a secretary general at the time. He walked up to me at the end and he said, you are the only one who can say something like this and walk away without being lynched. He said, did you, <laughs> he said, did you, did you look around the room? There were quite a few of them there who had come in through the barrel of the gun, but they are gone, which is very important. Almost every government is now elected. Communication is making a difference. Civil society is becoming very active and people know their rights, are beginning to understand their rights and are demanding them. So Africa is changing. The momentum is moving in the right direction and we should help them move on. Thank you. Thank you.